So Donna was uh, just sharing her heart here. And she said, doesn't matter what you're going through. Whatever your issue is, whatever, whatever struggle, the answer is Jesus. Right. And I thought, wow, is it, is it that simple? And the answer is yes. See, the, the truth is, you know, that the line in that song that just kept gripping me was, break every stronghold, shine through the darkness. See, that doesn't mean anything to you if you've never been in darkness. But I'm learning that the light of Christ is brighter than any darkness I can walk through. We've been, uh, over the last few weeks, talking about how this idea of pursuit sort of merges with who we are as a church. We talked about pursuing purpose, and last week we talked about pursuing passion. The passage we've read every week is Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 13. It's on the screen behind me. It says, you'll seek me and you'll find me when you seek me with all your heart. So today, we'll talk about the pursuit of people. L l listen to me. It's always been about people. You know, sometimes we, we get in the middle of church work and ministry stuff, and, and many of you guys volunteer and do, and do stuff here at the church, and sometimes we forget that. Sometimes we forget that all of these songs... And all of the stuff that we do and all the things that we say and, and all the, what new life and what our kids ministry and youth ministry, what all that's about is people. People. And we forget that sometimes. So I want today to be a very simple reminder to all of us. That, you know, you guys like to pick at me a little bit because I... I am a crybaby. I am a crybaby. And I've stopped apologizing for that. Because I, I want you to hear me and hear me well. When I start talking about people that are far from God and the tears flow, those tears are real. I've led a very good life. But I've walked through my own share of dark places. Maybe my dark places didn't look like yours. But if we were going to be honest with each other, we've all been in those places that, that Christ had to shine into. Right. See, I, I, I've, I've felt heartache. And I've known pain. And I've experienced suffering. And here's, here's what I want you to hear from me. There's been one common denominator in all of that. Is that in the midst of it, I've never had to walk through those things alone. And so today, I, I want us to talk about pursuing people. And, and what you think I'm going to tell you is not what I'm going to tell you. Because usually when I talk about this, I, I'm challenging you to share your faith and invite people to church. And all that is good and well, and we need to do all of those things. You should be sharing your faith. If, if, if you're redeemed and, and Christ has forgiven you of your sins, you're expected to share your faith. If you love your church, you're expected to invite people to come to church. But that's not what I'm going to talk about today. Because, it, see, if, if I spend too much time there, we're going to talk about systems and evangelism strategies, and we're not going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about people, because it's always been about people. Right now, 45 million people suffer with diagnosable substance abuse disorder. Right now. Right now, 40 to 50 percent of all marriages will end in divorce. 
Can, can I get off? I, I don't like to go off on rabbit trails, but, but can I go on phone one? How would you like me to t- teach you in, with three steps how to divorce proof your marriage? Three steps. We'll go from one and two to one in 1,246. The odds of you getting divorced will go from one in two to one in 1,246 if you'll do three things. You go to church with your wife, talk about the Bible, and pray with each other. All right. Now let's get back where we were. 45 million people suffer diagnosable substance abuse disorder. 17.3 million people experienced a major depressive episode. A little more than one out of every three persons in one study I read said, I feel lonely most of the time. It's about people. Do me a favor. I want everybody in the room Take a deep breath. And here, not yet, not yet, not yet. I want you to take a deep breath till you can't take any more air. You ready? All right. Once you couldn't take in any more, what was your natural instinct? Okay, now here's what I want you to do. I want you to expel as much air as you can until you can't expel any more. You ready? Go. Once you expelled as much as you could, what was your natural instinct? See, I believe that the, that the rhythm for every Christian, there ought to be an inhale and there ought to be an exhale. We, we talked about the inhale over the last two weeks. We talked about you discovering your purpose and discovering your passion. That's an inhale. That's you growing to be more like Jesus and, and, and His likeness being reflected in your life that's that's the inhale you're investing into your own life but there's got to be an exhale see if all you do is listen to the sermon fill in the blanks go to the conference read the book if all you do there's going to come a point where you just can't take in anymore and what's the natural response then breathe out Because there's 17.3 million people in depression. There's 45 million people addicted. And you have the answer. It's time to breathe. So I'm going I'm to give you three things to do. And these are very deep and profound and difficult things for us all to do. You ready? Here's the first one that you need to do. You need to do good. Do good. Do good. Do the right thing. Here's our example. Acts chapter 10, verse 38 says, How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth Nazareth, with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around good healing all who were under the power of the devil because god was with him our example is jesus everywhere he went he did good if he's our example then we ought to do good now what does that look like i I can't tell you that i don't know what that looks like for you i don't i don't know what doing the right thing is for you but i'm going to tell you that as christian people as Followers of Christ, our responsibility is to model Christ and do good. Luke chapter 6, Jesus said this, but to you who are listening, are you listening? To you who are listening, I say, love your enemies, do good, 
to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Anybody can do good in return. Jesus said to the person in your life that has caused you the greatest grief, the person in your life that's caused you the greatest heartache, the person in your life that has mistreated you the worst, do good to them. What, what, what happens when people who bear the name of Christ just live their lives to do good? What happens? I, I've grown a little weary with all of the arguments and all the factions online between, between churches arguing about doctrine. And, argue, and I know there's, that we need to be doctrinally sound. I get all that. But if you spend too much time on YouTube, here's what you're going to find. You're going to find Christian people talking about how awful each other is. Stop it. And just do good. Ma Mama said, if you can't say something good, shut it. That's how my mama said it. Romans chapter 12, verse 17. <laughs> do not repay anyone evil for evil. Is that basic human nature? Of course it is. You punch me in the face, I'm punching you in the mater patch. It's how it works. It's how I grew up, right? It's not, it's not what he said. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, in other words, do all you can, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with Everyone, even that person that hurt you, that mistreated you, yes. Verse 19, do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him, give him something to drink. In, in doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. I used to read that and go, yeah, I'm going to be good to him, so it'll, God will get him. <laughs> it's not what that means, by the way. What, what most Bible scholars think that that means and teach that that means is those, those, those heaping burning coals are conviction. In other words, you doing good will cause someone who isn't doing good to feel convicted and compelled to change yeah. you ever apologize to someone in the middle of a you, you were just back and forth back and forth back and forth and even though you felt like you might be right listen if i've offended you i'm sorry it's like it's like cold water on a fire mm. look look what it says in verse 21 do not be overcome by evil but overcome evil with There is one antidote for evil. And he was very good. His name was Jesus. And if he lives in you, if he lives in you, you are expected to invade your world with good. I get it. Listen, sometimes, sometimes it's hard. It's hard to do good especially when you feel like, and Donna said it well earlier, sometimes when you're pressing in to what God wants from your life and you're fasting and praying and trying to get more involved in your church and opening your Bible and trying to do those things, it makes hell very nervous and he, he, the, the enemy pushes against you and, and, and you feel the weight of that pressure and it's hard to be good 
in those moments, especially when other people get involved and they say things they shouldn't say and do things they shouldn't do. And the natural reaction is to repay evil with evil. But Christ has called you and me to overcome evil with good. What do we say to an unbelieving world when our response to mistreatment is to do good. What does it say to an unbelieving world when we feed our enemy? What does it say to an unbelieving world when we do good to those that have mistreated us? So the first thing, do good. Look at somebody say, do good. Look at your second choice and say, you should do good too. She's a lot of finger pointing going on out there. Do good. All right, it, it, it gets a little deeper now. You ready? Be kind. Paul said this to the Ephesian church, be kind and compassionate to one another. And then he qualified it. Look what he said, forgiving each other. Just as in Christ, God forgave you. How can I, how can I who has been forgiven for so much withhold forgiveness from someone that has offended me? See, I, I know what I've been forgiven for. And you know what you've been forgiven for and the argument is well it was unfair probably be kind (laughs) colossians chapter 3 says it this way since god chose you to be the holy people he loves you must clothe yourself clothe yourself with tender heart kindness Humility, gentleness, and patience. Listen, I I look out across this room and, and there's all sorts of walks of lives represented. Some of you are very educated. Some of you aren't. Some of you have incredible outgoing personality. Some of you are very introverted. Some of you have been walking the path with Christ for years and years and years and years and years, and some of you just getting started. But there's one thing that ought to mark all of us. It's kindness. (laughs) In fact, the New Testament teaches us that it's not the wrath of God that draws people to repentance. It is the kindness of God. That draws, you better be thankful he's kind. Because he was kind to you when you didn't deserve it. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so our challenge now is to reflect that kindness to people who are unkind to you. Is that difficult? Is it? That's a question. Yeah, it can be. (laughs) Galatians chapter 5 is... We talked about the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. And, and the reason I read this to you is I want you to make sure that you understand that I'm not talking about some fake bubblegum, lollipop, paint on a smile kindness. How many know you? I, how many can see through that? Yeah. I, I, that doesn't mean anything. Don't, be, don't paint on a smile. Don't. Talk to me about how much you like me and then beat me up behind my back. See, that's that's not what the Holy Spirit does, by the way. The Holy Spirit produces love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And then Paul gets sarcastic. How many of you there's sarcasm in the Bible? He, He lists these nine things. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And then he says, against such things, there's no law. That's sarcasm. He said, there is no law that's going to prevent you from being kind. 
There's no law that's going to prevent you from being good. There's no law that's going to prevent you from being gentle and having self-control. They're not going to arrest you for being good to people. Do good. Look at somebody say, do good. Say, be kind. Here we go. So do good, be kind, imitate Jesus. I read this passage to you in the very first week because I told you that you and I share the same purpose that Jesus had. And that people have a hard time with that because, you know, Jesus was Jesus and you aren't and I'm not right Jesus was Jesus but he's called us to do the same thing he did in fact he said greater works will you do than I've done how can he say that that don't make sense how can he say greater works will you do because Jesus even though he was God in the flesh was limited to one voice right You know, there's 2 billion Christian people on the planet now. So greater works, greater, not greater sermons, but more of them, right? Here's what Jesus came to do. Jesus came in Luke 19, 10. the, The Son of Man came to seek and save those who are lost. I I find it interesting when when Christian people beat up folks who are are far from God because they act and behave like they're far from God. Guess what you do when you're far from God? You act like it. And sometimes that looks like hurt, and sometimes that looks like mistreatment. Sometimes that looks like slander. Sometimes it looks like uh, uh, drama. Oh, anybody just hate drama? I'm like, I do. I hate drama. I just I I don't I don't like it. That's why I, y'all didn't see me on Facebook a whole lot recently, because there's a lot of drama on Facebook. <laughs> I'm not wrong. So, in in this, I told you that I wasn't going to give you some great evangelism strategy, but I kind of am. How many believe? That as followers of Christ, we ought to be about the business of evangelism. Yes. Sharing our faith with others. How many believe that? Yes. How about I give you the greatest evangelism strategy that's ever been known? When I was, uh, I guess I was hmm, probably 13 or 14, I went to uh, a church youth camp and they had a class called Do Tell. <laughs> and it was all about how to share your faith with your friends. And they gave us a notebook and worksheets, and it was very cool. And I never did it. I didn't, because it was was so academic, and it was so structured. And it just, and I was neither of those things at 13. I'm a much better student at 50, how old am I? (laughs) I like Jordan better than I was then, yeah. I I tell you, when I started being effective with sharing my faith, and it it wasn't when I went to a class, it it wasn't when I, you know, memorized the Romans road to salvation. If you grew up Southern Baptist, you know the Romans road. Any Southern Baptist, yeah, you know that. You know what that looks like. Yeah. It. I started sharing my faith effectively. When I fell in love with Jesus. Mm -hmm. Write this down. A genuine pursuit of Christ will result in a heart that loves people. Um, You can read 1st, 2nd, 3rd John and and you'll get this. You'll get this. uh, This theme that runs through there. I'm not going to. I'm just going to give you kind of an underlying theme. If you say you're a Christian and you don't love people. Go back to the altar. That's what he said. If you say you love Jesus, but you don't love your brother, you don't love others, then something didn't take. 
What happens when you genuinely love people with the love of Christ, as Christ fills your heart and you genuinely love people, you're, you become attractive. Not like, you know. You become attractive to a world that's starving for what you have. You become attractive to, to those people that, that are in the dark places because the light of Christ shines in you. The greatest, the greatest tool I've ever heard, the greatest analogy I've ever heard for evangelism was evangelism is one beggar telling another beggar where he found the bread. So when you do what we've been talking about over the last four weeks and pursue Jesus and, and chase Him and love Him and learn more about who He is and the way He does things and His love begins to fill your heart, you'll become attractive to people who are in dark places. As long as you don't, I recognize that you're in a dark place and I am not. So I'm going to give you, I don't remember how many I gave you, four, four things. Four things, here we go, really quickly, that Christians are called to do. You are called to bring healing to the hurting. I can't, I can't do that. I'm not capable of bringing healing to the hurting. That's Jesus' job, right? I'm not capable of bringing healing to the hurting. I'm going to argue with you. Who fed the 5,000? Who fed the 5,000 people? It's not a trick question. Jesus multiplied the bread. Then he handed it to the disciples. And they fed the 5,000. Listen, the work of forgiveness and redemption has been long since done and accomplished. And if you know Jesus, He's forgiven you and washed you and cleansed you. And you know what redemption feels like. This is how it feels to be free. Yeah. Mm. And now it's our job to take that. Jesus said it this way. Matthew chapter 5, you, you, you are the light of the world. Shine through the shadows, light of the world. Like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let you shine out. For let your what come? good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly father mm. lord help us bring healing to the hurting but Dwayne, i'm hurting i don't know how this works y'all i wish i could give you some theological underpinning for how this works but it just does If you'll be a light when you're hurting, God has a way of, of taking that light that you're sharing and shining it right back on your own soul. I, I, don't, I don't know how it works. I don't know. How, it, 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 would, it, it, seems, it, it seems backwards, but if, if maybe you're in the middle of a dark place and you'll shine a light on somebody else, here's what will happen. It'll shine right back at you. So that's, that's the first thing. The second thing, uh, write this down. Be a conduit of forgiveness and peace. Colossians 3 says, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, you also must forgive. I, I, want, I want you to hear this. And this is not the first time you've heard me say it, but I'm going to say it again. Unforgiveness is a cancer. 
and it'll consume you, and it'll hurt you. I, I wonder if, what, what, what are we known for? I, I'm afraid that the, the modern church has has become known now more for what it's against than what it's for. Let's be for something. You know what I'm for? I'm for reconciliation, and I'm for redemption, and I'm for healing, and I'm for forgiveness. Listen, I've been forgiven. I've been forgiven. My slate has been wiped clean. God took my sin and cast him in a sea of forgiveness, never to be remembered again. He cast them, this is what the Old Testament says, as far as the east is from the west. Isn't that that cool? Listen, if you go north, you'll eventually go south. If you go east continually, you're always going east. There's no way east and west can meet. He cast my sin as far as the east is from the west. How dare I hold a grudge against a brother? See, I, I want to be known for forgiveness. I want our church to be known for uh, a place of forgiveness and peace. I want our church to be known for a place where people who are in dark places can come and find some light. Amen? Amen. Number three. This one's hard. Live a life of humility. There may be no arrogance worse than spiritual arrogance. Maybe you've experienced that. Somebody was very quick to point out just how holy they are and how wretched you are. <laughs> this is a funny story, but it, it, it stuck with me for a long time. So I'd given my heart to the Lord, and we were doing this big Easter deal at my home church. And... For some reason, I got the silly part. I don't know why. I got the silly part. And me and two of my buddies were three kings, the three kings. It might have been Christmas. Maybe it was Christmas. Three kings. And we did this, this uh, you know, entrance. We were all, you know, kinged up. And we did this little dance, and it was kind of like the Russian thing. I can't do it anymore. Yeah, it was bad. It was, it was no, that's not going to happen. <laughs> not going to happen. A- and and it, was, it was hilarious, and it was funny, and it was right in the middle, and it was kind of a break between all the serious parts. And then at the end of that deal, the altars were filled with people giving their heart to the Lord, and it was cool. It was so cool. Till I came across a deacon. The deacon looked at me eyeball to eyeball and said, I just want you to know, you ruined that whole thing. And, and I lost it. I, I lost it. I was, I was, I was broken hearted. And I went to my pastor. I'm like, did, did we ruin this? And he's like, no, nope. no, nope. don't let some fuddy duddy ruin what, what God had did in that night. And, and, and I, so I understand what spiritual arrogance looks like because I saw it that day. L- listen to me. I don't care how holy you get. Your righteousness is a filthy rag. So here's, here's what, uh, we, we need to walk our life with humility. Philippians 2 says, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourself. Well, what if they're not better than me? Then you need to be <laughs> Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others as well. Don't look out for just you. Live a life of humility. And then lastly, this is the last thing I'm going to say to you that I don't want you to fill in. Follow Jesus closely. Yeah. Just follow Jesus closely. Here's, you know, I struggled with how we were going to end today's service, and I think I, I know what I want us to do. Don's going to come. In fact, I want our whole praise team to come back. <laughs> Take your time, guys. That's fine. Take your time. <laughs> Let 
Let, let, let me tell you why, why this, why, why I want you to get this today. Anybody want to guess what it is 10 weeks from today? Easter. 10 weeks from today. And, and I, don't, I don't know why it works this way, but it just does. I don't care what church you go to. Big church, small church, Easter's a huge day. Listen, I, 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 I'm like every other pastor on the planet. I want to see us break attendance records on Easter. I'd love that. Can I really tell you what I'm looking for this Easter? This altar. I want people to find Jesus. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do with me starting today. You start praying for Easter Sunday morning. And I want you to find that person in your mind that might be in a dark place. And I want you, listen, we're, we're going to do what we do every year. You're going to have little invite cards you can throw their way and you can do all that stuff and that's going to be cool and you're going to share all the social media that we do every year. All that's going to be great. Pick out somebody in your life and do three things to them for the next 10 weeks. Do good. Be kind. Imitate Jesus. I, don't, don't beat them over the head with a 74-pound Schofield reference Bible. Do good. Be kind. Imitate Jesus. Hey, pick out that guy in your office that gets on your nerves. You know what? I want, I want you to do three things to him. Do good. Be kind. Imitate Jesus. Here's how we're going to end this service. You're going to stand to your feet. Maybe there's something in your life you need to speak the name of Jesus over. Maybe there's a dark place in your own life that you need to speak the name of Jesus over. Maybe there's something going on in your family that you need to speak the name of Jesus over. Maybe you're battling your own addiction and this morning you need to speak the name of Jesus over. Maybe this morning you've walked in this building and you painted on a smile and you told everybody that things were fine, but you didn't want to get out of bed this morning because you were depressed and anxious. How about you speak the name of Jesus over your anxiousness and depression? Because he's enough, y'all. He's enough. We're going to end this service in a moment of worship. Sing with them. I just want to speak the name of Jesus Over every heart and every mind Cause I know there is peace within
given to our Savior. His name is Jesus. And it's in His name that we pray. And it's in His name that we worship. And it's in Him that we live and move and have our being. So we speak Jesus over families today. God, we believe that You're able and more than able to restore and reconnect as only You can. And we speak Jesus over those people struggling with addiction this morning. We're struggling with direction, struggling in the dark places. You're able and more than able to do exceedingly, abundantly above all we can ask or even imagine. And by the authority of Christ, we believe that God is at work and He's done a work in the hearts and lives of men and women. And we speak His name, the name that's above every name. Would you say it with me? His name is Jesus. 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 Come on, worship Him. Worship Him. Worship the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we love you. Thank you for your presence this morning. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this house. Thank you for these people. We leave here on assignment to do good, to be kind, to imitate Jesus. Help us by the power of your Spirit. In Christ's name, everybody said, come on, lift the Lord an ovation of praise. Amen. 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 God bless you. Have a great afternoon.